Okie dokie. We're going live here in a few seconds. Let's let this thing load up. Icon, you're a freaking regular here, eh? Mr. Staff from Pear Tree. Hey Ryan, how you doing? I am one statistic. Clever name. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. It is uh, St. Patrick's Day after all. So, you know, we had to uh, thank you, Peter. Yeah, we had to get that going. Pete, uh, Pete's condition with joining me here tonight was, uh, well, last time was he was saying maybe we could do this with uh, cheap beers next time. It's St. Patrick's Day, though, so can't go with cheap beer. So we got we got this to keep us company tonight. I see Pete's here, so let's Pete in, and uh, let's get going. Come on, Pete. Let's get this thing going. Boop, boop, boop. All right, so today we were talking about hybrid bases, hybrid methods, how it saves time, how it saves money, how it prevents callbacks. And we're just going to keep trying to get Pete in. And there's some little uh, technical difficulties here. But yeah, I uh, didn't get a lot of questions uh, sent in. So hopefully we get some uh, cool questions coming up. I know Pete got a couple sent to him uh, via DM. And uh, yeah, well, I'm going to keep buying time while we try to get Pete going here. But basically, um, we talked about how it's important to understand the use of a hybrid base in addition to the other bases that exist um, for hardscape construction. We already know dense graded material. That's something that's uh, easy to use. Uh, everyone's using that right now. Everyone's aware of that. That's your three quarter minus or your ASTM D2940 material. Uh, so that part is uh, good to go. We're using that. You have to compact that to 98% standard proctor density, and then you can street your bedding layer and lay your favors on top. Challenges with that material are compaction. Um, it's not that uh, hybrid is a magic pill. That's not it at all. But it is a material that, uh, what's up, Pete? I was, I'm there on, in spirit. We try to get them in again. Uh, it's not that uh, it's a magic pill, but it is a material that is 95% consolidated when dumped. Therefore, if I can take that clean stone, I can put it in my excavated trench from my retaining wall, or I can uh, create my base for my, uh, my pavement. As long as that remains encapsulated in the geotextile, I'm okay. Uh, because then the pavers are on top, so there's nowhere for this material to move around. The common argument with uh, open grade material is it's easy to displace. If I walk around on a pile of clean stone, I sink in, it moves around. That's because it's not consolidated. Having it wrapped in fabric, pavers on top, that envelope, as long as that remains sealed, that stone can't go anywhere. Therefore, the ability for it to displace loads uh, remains the same and you're okay. So that should, be, uh, that should be the big thing to retain for anybody who's not using it right now in terms of does it actually work? Is it strong enough? Then in terms of the, I don't know what's up with Pete. He's having, uh, he's having issues. Try restarting your phone, Pete, because I keep seeing the uh, unable to join. How's the audio now? Is that better? Yes, it is. All right, cool.
Yes to same. Yes, the sound is better. Or okay, it's good now. Okay, all right, cool. Uh, I'm gonna try adding Pete one more time here. If not, we're going solo. <laughs> Which uh, we can do too, no problem. So you got that stone. Uh, the open graded stone represents that other benefit, which is the moisture uh, is not uh, a, a factor during compaction because compaction is not a factor. Uh, another key benefit, Phil talked about this in the episode, and that was uh, how dense graded material, when you compact it, uh, it densifies. Therefore, you lose volume. What that means is if I have a truckload of dense graded material coming in, and I build my base with that, and I compact that material, it will densify and I will lose 25% of the volume. I just had just as many truckloads coming in. It's still one full truckload, but that one full truckload now represents 25% less volume. This could mean another delivery of stone would be required. If I'm working with open graded material, well then I don't have that issue, why? Because the open graded material is already consolidated. So that one full truckload coming in, Every cubic yard coming in is a cubic yard of base material. So the calculation gets easier. And over the course of an entire season of projects, every single truckload is equal to one truckload. So there are some cost savings there as well. Material management savings too. So there's quite a few benefits. Um, the drawbacks, one of the concerns, and we talked about this, is where does the water go? So it's important to understand the soil that you have. And if you have a soil that's draining too slowly, well, then that's a problem. Um, you might want to consider putting something in like a French drain or a perforated pipe that leads out to a dry well um, or other area or just out into the environment on the property, dep depending on the project. But it certainly is a good method to consider because you build it faster. There's less risk of callbacks and issues. Uh, and it's less uh, susceptible to freeze-thaw movements as well because any moisture that does get into the base is not a problem. Why? Because that base material is 35 to 42% void space. So any moisture that does get in there, if it freezes, it expands. It doesn't displace the stone. It just expands into the void spaces. So it really is a very good solution. I'm uh, a little distracted because uh, Pete keeps pinging me here, but I can't get him in. Uh, where is the best to put drive grid? Some people say on base, some say in the middle of the base. Okay, so drive grid is uh, basically a triaxial grid that is marketed in the marketplace. Um, it represents, uh, and this is an important thing to clarify. So uh, geo grid, you have basically three types. You have uniaxial, which means it's strong in one direction. That's best used behind a retaining wall to uh, stabilize the soils behind the wall. A lot of people think grid is used to hold the wall forward. That's not what it does. Grid stabilizes this material, so it applies less load on the wall. That's part one. So that's uniaxial grid. The second type of grid is biaxial grid, which is strong in two directions. This is good under raised patios or in pavements. Uh, why? Because the loads applied on the surface, let's say it's a raised patio, people are walking this way or they're walking this way. So being able to distribute loads in all directions is an advantage. Triaxial grid works in three directions. So there's a third dimension like this, uh, which is great in commercial applications. Uh, for example, we're building our uh, new manufacturing facility in air. And for that super heavy duty industrial traffic, we are going to be using a triaxial grid to reduce the overall base thickness and save us thousands and thousands of dollars in the construction process. In a residential setting, do I need to go all the way up to a, tri a triaxial grid? It's not necessary because I don't have that third force in a residential application. I don't have the extreme loads. I don't have truck loads uh, coming in. So a biaxial is more than sufficient for my uh, base stabilization or my base reinforcement in a um, pavement application like a driveway or a patio or a pool deck or something like that. In our experience, where it appears to offer the best uh, solution is in the middle of the base. Uh, why? Because it's just aiding in the conical distribution of load. So actually, I'm going to try to pull this up real quick and show you guys what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna to go to our YouTube channel, YouTube 
youtube.com slash techoblock. I'm going to show you guys at the same time how to search for this stuff. So I'm on the uh, YouTube channel here. I'm going to go to the search right there. Boom. I'm just going to put in GeoGrid. Oops, GeoGrid. And uh, how GeoGrid works for pavement. So let's check this one out right here. And uh, I'm going to tell you what's going on. So GeoGrid, what does it do? It reinforces the soils. It increases the gravity capabilities of SRW. It stabilizes aggregates and pavements is what's most important in a pavement. So there's the uniaxial and there's the biaxial, strong in two directions. When you look at a soil, a soil uh, under load will want to spread apart. When you add GeoGrid into a soil, what it does is it confines the individual particles and it prevents them from wanting to spread wider under load. Therefore, when you put it in a pavement situation, the conical distribution of load hits that grid and because the grid is stabilizing those particles, it actually spreads out wider. So because it spreads out wider, by the time it reaches this bottom layer here, which is the compacted soil subgrade, it has been so spread out. Yes, that's the old logo because it's an old video, I know. Uh, but because it's been so spread out, let me just come back to that frame here and pause it. Because it's so spread out, the possibility of rutting up here because this would want to push down into the soil is reduced significantly. Therefore, putting my geogrid in here, a biaxial geogrid, like a gator grid 3030 uh, 30 or 5050, would stabilize my base and basically uh, equate to a thicker base. So to achieve the same width of load distribution that we see from left to right, I would need a thicker base normally. I'm trying to, I'm winging it here, but I would need a thicker base. By having that grid, I can reduce my base thickness by a certain percentage. What that percentage is, I'm not gonna tell you because I'm not an engineer, but I do know that if you're working with a eight to 10 inch base, you can probably get away with a six inch base by putting in that grid. Looking at the price of grid and looking at the price of excavation and base material, you'll probably see a savings, not only in the time, but also in the cost of materials, the hauling, and then over many, uh, many months of work to wear and tear on your machines and so on and so forth. But if it can reduce your construction um, time by even you know, 10%, let's say you build 30 projects in a year, a reduction in construction time by 10% translates into a third, uh, you know, another three jobs over the course of the year. So in the context from a, if we take it out of the con construction standpoint, we get into the business standpoint, we're running businesses and these businesses are designed to make money, to grow profits and to feed our families and the families of all of our uh, team members. So with that in mind, if I can get more work done in less time, that means that I can generate more revenue for my business and provided I'm profitable with that revenue, I am generating a much healthier income for my business, which means that I could uh, give myself a raise, give myself a bonus at the end of the year, give my team a bonus at the end of the year. I could do a draw on those profits and invest in the company or do some kind of a nice vacation with the family, with the kids, whatever. These are all doors that get opened by increasing your efficiency. And that's why we wanted to talk about hybrid bases uh, today, because it's, it's an underutilized approach to building hardscapes. Any other questions? So uh, I hope uh, our Vizana 917, I answered your question there. I'm just scrolling around looking for, uh, for questions. Yes, Peter, it is, it is money in the bank when you do that. Um, other things that came up. So that's the biaxial grid um, usage. So again, not the triaxial grid or what's marketed as a drive grid is bad. It's not bad. It's very good. Do you need to, to go to that extent? Probably not in a residential setting. It looks like we might get Pete this time. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. I don't know what's up, but uh, Paver Pete must upgrade app. Pete, you have to do your updates on your phone, buddy. Uh, to prevent migration of the bedding layer, Oh, and I got another question. Okay, so let me come back to that. To prevent migration of the bedding layer, what do you recommend? Okay, so great question. So in this case, actually, I'm going to come back to uh, 
this cross section since I have it here. So the, this question means this layer here, what do I do to make sure this layer doesn't migrate into this one? Because this is all open graded stone and this is a smaller open graded stone. The answer to the question is nothing. Uh, in a residential application, unless you're going to be seeing a lot of vehicular traffic uh, at you know, moderate to high speeds, uh, which will cause, cause a lot of vibration along the top of the pavers, that vibration will work its way down and want to work those smaller particles down into the openings of the bigger ones. That's not really a concern. You could install a geotextile between the base and the bedding, but it's not required in a residential setting because you won't see that type of traffic. What happens is the two materials choke out. There's a, a choking effect, choking effect that takes place. So because of the angularity of the particles, your three quarter inch stone is sharp angular particles with a lot of friction and your number eight stone uh, or a quarter inch chip is sharp angular particles. They do go down, but eventually they kind of lock up there. So you're okay. So once you've screened that sand and uh, you've started laying pavers, that's not gonna go anywhere. If you were under heavy vehicular traffic, seeing a lot of vibration along the top, you could put a geotextile between the two layers, but that is extra work, extra money, and in residential settings, you don't really need to do it. We see that, and that's not just like Alex saying this, but we see that with permeable applications too. Permeable installations, hybrid installations are very similar. The main difference being what's happening on the surface. If we're not seeing migration or settlement of that bedding layer into the base, over decades of work, then it's not really a problem. Uh, so that's that question. I see another question here. I've been installing interlocking pavers on open graded stone since I started in the business 20 years ago. What's the big deal? What? There is no big deal. If you've been doing it, then that's, that's fine. It works. Like we were saying in the show today, you have four base options you can consider. You have dense graded, you have open graded, which we're talking about today called hybrid in the market. You have synthetic base, which we're talking about next week, products like Gator Base, and you have concrete overlays. Open graded stone has been used forever in the context of segmental retaining walls and for many decades now, almost 50 years for permeable pavements. So using it in an interlocking pavement as a base, provided we're taking consideration, where does the water go if water could be a problem because of my soil type? then there's nothing to worry about. There is no big deal. Uh, since Pete can't get in, he's sending me the questions that he's getting from people. So I use full depth granite curb on all my jobs. Will that work on hybrid as well? Yeah. So what we're saying is, uh, we're talking about an instance where, I'll draw it out. We're talking about a situation where I have, I'm trying to do this for you guys. So we have our excavated area. This is our compacted soil subgrade here. Boom, 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 boom. We got the edge uh, or the uh, ends of the excavation. We have our geotextile that in a normal installation would come up and wrap here. What we're saying is I'm putting in a full depth granite curb that may be going down all the way to the bottom of that excavation. I would have my base. I would have my bedding. I'm having trouble drawing a straight line, and I would have my pavers. Preferably, depending on the type of curbing, your pavers would be a little bit higher than the, uh, than the curb, but that's not the end of the world, depending on, again, the type of curb. So if you have an elevated curb, maybe your pavers look like this. I'm hoping I'm answering this question okay for, uh, for whatever Pete sent in, but that would be that curb there. Now, um, in a dense graded application, so let's say this was your ASTM C2940 or D2940. Let's say this was your crusher run or a gravel. If that material is here, that means I would be using usually a washed concrete sand for my bedding layer. What happens with this type of edge is because this will be moving independently of all this, there is the potential for a gap to open up in this area here. So because a gap can open up in this area, to prevent that, what we recommend is the installation of a geotextile along here and wrap it up the side there. That way my sand cannot work its way down in between into this area here. 
I know I'm doing a lot of scribbling, but just follow the pen. So my sand could be going down into there if I don't have that fabric along here. Now, because it's open graded, the particle size should not be an issue in that case. That would be my opinion in that uh, situation. So I hope I answered that. On the other side here, if I was putting in an edge restraint, my edge restraint, I would want to encapsulate my bedding, encapsulate my pavers. And like we saw, there's that pave tool um, hybrid edging with that V-shaped spike that would be driven in to anchor the edging to the base. And that would prevent the pavers from moving here. Alternatively, what I can use is uh, a reinforced concrete product like Extreme Edge from Alliance, which I would trowel in on a 45, and that would be reinforced. So that's what this little symbol here is. So I could reinforce that with uh, pieces of rebar, or I could reinforce that with fiberglass fibers, uh, which is what uh, the Extreme Edge is. It's basically a uh, proprietary mix of um, cement with um, a bit of aggregate, a bit of fiber, you mix that up with water, and you throw it in and you're good to go. So that's a great edge restraint option. And actually, uh, I got it here. So I'll show you real quick. So what's great about this, you got that fiber mixed in. It's stronger than just plain mixed Portland because of those fibers. And you wanna have that because especially in a freeze thaw uh, susceptible climate, that material will expand and contract as will your pavers, as will your base, as will your bedding, all independently. So having a material that is bound together uh, is a good thing to have. And that's why that extreme edge is a good option. Now, pave tools option, which is, uh, actually I have that here, so let me show you. Uh, boo, 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 boo. Here it is. So the pave tool hybrid edging is this one here. So it uh, looks a lot like PVC edging, except it's made of aluminum. In a dense graded application, I would be using uh, my spikes. And what's cool is they have this stitching technology that allows them to go in on an angle, which gives a better bite into that dense graded material. And if I'm not using dense graded material, if I'm using open graded material, then the wedge shaped or V-shaped spike here is a great, great option. That slides right in. And because of its shape, it resists the horizontal loads in an open graded material. If you try to use just regular spikes in open graded material, they won't bite in. They'll just move right through that material and you won't have a solid edge restraint. And that is the main consideration uh, when building hybrid pavements. You wanna make sure that your edge restraints are good and strong. So a full bed depth curb like we were just showing there or a fiber reinforced concrete along the edge or uh, use of a hybrid edge like that. Those are your best options in hybrid installations. So hope that uh, that handles that question. Um, what else we got here? Oh, hold on. What's your best approach when dealing with sandy sites? Well, sandy sites, now we have to co qualify this a little bit because sandy soils drain very well. However, you can have sandy soils that have a strong clay content. So it is important to identify the type of soil that you're working with. If your soil has more than 30% clay, that means that it behaves like clay and you should treat it as clay. That means it will drain slower than regular sand. It means it is more susceptible to expansion contraction with the seasons. It also means it has a lower bearing ability than just straight sand. So it's important to, to know how much sand, how much clay you're working with. Um, usually can tell this with experience. Um, and if you're not sure and you want to get a lab test done, it's not that much. I think it's about 175 to 200 bucks. You get a, a soil sample to the lab. They do the lab test. They tell you what the soil breakdown is uh, using the uh, USDA. Uh, that's the United States Department of Agriculture uh, pyramid. It'll tell you where it's situated based on the clay, the uh, sand and the silt particle types. It'll triangulate it and tell you what your mix is. As long as you're less than 30% clay, you're good to go uh, in terms of you know, strength and, and ability to drain. But uh, if your soil drains very well, and that means that water, you can do a test hole at the pro appropriate depth, so the same depth as your base would be. Um, if that water drains away in 24 to 48 hours, you're okay because you would need tremendous like torrential downpours 
to fill the entire volume of your base with water and have that be a problem over 24, 48 hour period. So if that water drains down, you're okay. Uh, you probably wouldn't need to consider adding something like a French drain or any other type of, of drain structure. Um, you're okay. Uh, so ultimately, nothing to worry about. The water will go down through the joints, through the bedding, through the base, through the fabric, and through down and return to the water table. So it's kind of like a, a, a permeable system. Now, keep in mind, if you're compacting that soil, to uh, what you are to increase its uh, strength, then its uh, drainage ability gets reduced. But again, in the sandy soil, shouldn't be a concern. Um, again, it, it's really based on experience and it's based on the soil type, but typically sandy soils drain well. It's one of their characteristics. Pete, if you are watching, you need to update your, uh, your uh, Instagram app. That's what uh, I'm getting as a notification. So every time you try to join, it's saying, Dave or Pete needs to update his app. So if you can do that, then I can get you in here. So I hope that answers the question about uh, sandy soils. Um, do, do, can, what can, me, can my feature walls and structural walls be built on the same base? How will the grade change? Um, okay, can you be a little more specific? Because technically, can I build my feature walls and structural walls on the same base as my pavement? in a hybrid situation? The answer is yes. Uh, if the base uh, thickness can accommodate for the embedment of a structural wall, then you're okay. What I mean by that is uh, my segmental retaining wall, and I'll draw this too. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Let me just do a new page here. So let's say I have a segmental retaining wall to build. So I'm gonna excavate my trench here. I got my bench cut excavation, I got my base, I got my wall, I got my pitch behind the wall to get water away. That's a low permeability fill. I got my cap here, extra layer, boom. This is my base. So can this base be the same base as my pavement? Well, I need to respect the 666 rule, meaning that from the toe of the wall to the edge of the base, that needs to be at least six inches. From the heel of the wall to the back of the base, that needs to be six inches. The thickness of the base needs to be at least six inches. And I need to embed 10% of the height of the wall. So from here to here, this needs to be 10% or six inches. Therefore, my uh, wall system needs to kind of look like this. I'm exaggerating the slope away, but that's just to say that the water is pitched away from the wall. So knowing that a structural wall needs to have these conditions, that means that my pavement cannot necessarily be built on the exact same base. I need to have this part going lower and then my pavement could represent that embedment. So I could have my six inches of base plus two inches of pavers and go along there like that. In the case of a decorative wall or feature wall, like a bench or a fire pit or a, or a grill island, well, not a grill island, because that should be on a slab, but let's say a bench, that means I can have my base across here. We'll do our bottom excavation. We have our fabric. No, shoot. We have our fabric along here. We have, this is our open graded stone right? All the same size. So it's three quarter inch clean stone or ASTM number 57 stone. I have my bedding. So let's say this is my one inch thick number eight stone, right? So this is all smaller angular particles. Can I build my feature wall here, my little seat wall with a little cap and have my pavers going along there? Yeah, I can. So that's, that's, uh, that's no different. I could also build this wall directly on the base if I wanted to. Uh, either way is fine. Let me flip this back around. So either way is fine in that situation. Let's get this back down. Seriously, that tablet is sweet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was my Christmas gift to myself. It's uh, the Remarkable 2 and uh, it feels just like paper. And uh, it's pretty awesome, yeah. 
Yeah, sometimes I, I get myself some nice stuff. So what else do we have as questions, guys? Honestly, if you haven't built with a uh, hybrid base before, you should absolutely try it on a project. You will not regret it. It saves a ton of time. Uh, I was on that first project with Pete and Phil in 2015 at Phil's house. There, it's not a joke at all. And if you uh, look on um, on uh, YouTube on uh, the Pave Tool channel, I'm going to look this up too, and I'll show you guys. Phil did a video last year where he does a full walkthrough. Oh, Armor Stone Interlock asked the question too. Uh, he did the full walkthrough, and doing that full walkthrough. He shows the entire performance of the project as it is right now. The only issue he has is at the edge of the pavement. So we had all that blue and it goes to that, that strip of Villaggio with Antica in the middle. And that's the drain for that pavement. The only thing he has is that stone is collecting pollen and dust and whatever. And he should probably just pressure wash and clean it out. That's it. That's all after six years now. So it's, it's performing really well. So uh, Harmer Stone Interlock, sorry, I missed your question. Orleans, Ottawa, yep, been there a ton of times, has a lot of clay. I always amend my bases with clear stone and type S mortar, good. On a hybrid base, would it still need a French drain or a weeping tile drain? Uh, I would say yes. Why? Because you have that clay. I've been on many job sites there. It's crappy clay. It does not drain well. It's very dense. Uh, and especially once you've compacted it, any openings, any absorption level of that soil has been reduced because you've tightened it up. And by tightening it up, less water gets in. If you add Portland cement, type S mortar, which is Portland cement and lime mixed together, you're getting the chemical reaction, which is uh, turning some of those particles and allowing moisture to get out, reinforcing the soil. But you're also adding a Portland cement layer, which is impermeable. So water will not get in there if you're using that approach. Therefore, you want to make sure that your bottom of excavation mirrors the pitch of your pavement. So if I'm sloping away from the house, let's say by 2% or 2.5%, 2% is good, it's a quarter inch per foot, then my bottom of excavation should be doing the same. At the lowest point, I should have a pipe, perforated pipe. Make sure you have four inches of stone the whole way around. Stone acts as a filter for the pipe, holes down. That way, any water that does accumulate in here, and we're again, we're not expecting a ton because the top is full of polymeric sand. So not a lot of water gets in through there. But whatever does, it goes, accumulates, it hits the pipe and runs out. The reason we do it like that, holes down, is because any dust, any debris, any particles that could be floating in the water because the stone isn't like washed perfectly squeaky clean, there's a lot of dust in there, you don't want that to hit the pipe, and if the holes are up, the pipe gradually fills up with dust. So by having holes down, dust always settles in the stone below, water builds up, hits the pipe, pipe is pitched out, you're good to go. So you can do that. Alternatively, you could build it like a permeable system. And the way you do that, again, if you go back to that video, uh, you'll see that we scarify soil in permeable applications. So that is when you use the teeth on the bucket, to scratch that soil down two to four inches. And what it does is instead of having this as a surface area, you now have a surface area that looks like this. You fill this layer up with number eight stone. That reinforces this kind of weak pieces of clay area, but it gives you a filtration layer and much more surface area for water to get absorbed. So that's what you would do in a permeable application. If you're not trying to do that, then the simplest thing compact it, amend it like you normally do, pipe, run that pipe out to a dry well on the side, and provided the surface area isn't so big that your dry well has to be like 10 feet in the ground to be effective, then, then you're okay. If you do have a really big surface area, then I would consider the other way, which is scarifying and basically building it like a permeable system, except you're capping the top. And that is if you're not building permeable. The question then is why not just build a permeable pavement? It's better for the environment. Uh, it's uh, just as easy to build. And actually, in Ottawa, uh, there's the uh, Rain Ready Ottawa program, which is uh, set to launch in April of this year, where the city will be providing tax credits to residents who uh, implement uh, rainwater management systems on their property. So permeable pavements are a part of that. So uh, I know it already exists in many parts of North America right now. 
Uh, and I know, like, for example, in Ottawa, in certain boroughs, if you do want to extend your driveway, that part has to be permeable. Well, now they're going one step further. So if you live in Ottawa, Ottawa area, uh, or in Toronto, I know they have this, or basically any major metropolitan area, you absolutely need to be learning about permeable pavements because uh, they are becoming more and more mandated by the cities. And we can help you with that. We have a ton of great resources. If you go to the same YouTube channel and you search permeable, you can find a bunch of videos there. Uh, you can read the Teco spec book which I have over here. And uh, there's a whole section on permeable pavements, which uh, starts on doo -doo -doo -doo. starts on page 90 of the spec book. And you can read all the steps, all the special considerations. There are cross-section drawings in there too. And uh, permeable pavements, absolutely something to consider. Uh, the, the simpler version of permeable is you put interlocking pavement on top with polymeric sand in the joints. What tablet is that? Again, it's the Remarkable 2. Uh, it's kind of in a Kickstarter mode, so I ordered mine in August. I got it in December, so don't expect it to show up at your door tomorrow morning. Uh, la, 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 la. Yes, Alliance Gator Ontario is going live with Paper Pete tomorrow. Uh, they're talking about open graded base as well. They're building on clean stone, so it's going to be pretty cool. Sock the pipe. No, no sock on the pipe. Why? Because the sock will clog faster than four inches of stone the whole way around the pipe. So no, never use socks. We don't use socks in our pipe. Uh, there's no application in hardscaping to use a sock pipe. So, uh, and with regards to that pipe, preference is a schedule 40 pipe. So as a smooth walled, rigid pipe, holes down. You can buy this. Uh, most major uh, home renovation centers have it. Plumbing centers have it. Good dealers, good tackle block authorized dealers carry it. Uh, if you are going to use a flexible perforated pipe, you can do that. Uh, it's not ideal for the reason I was describing before, just because there's holes all the whole way around. So the sediment could collect in there. Is it a huge deal? No, but if you can build it right, build it right. If you can't get your hands on schedule 40 pipe perforated holes down, then your alternative is the flex pipe. Perforated flex pipe is fine. Four inches. Uh, diameter and always four inches of stone the whole way around. Do, 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 do. Did you guys just say, uh, yes, I said Ottawa. I've been to Ottawa many, many times. What's everyone using for poly? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, frankly, I'm a little biased because uh, we sell FlexLock products, which are made by Alliance uh, Designer Products. But I think one of the big things is with any products, whether it be pavers, whether it be balls, uh, walls, whether it be uh, sand, whether it be tools, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're working with um, a company where you can have some kind of partnership, where there's actually someone who's gonna answer the phone, respond to your emails, and show up when you have an issue. And that's one of the reasons why we chose to have our products private labeled by Alliance Designer Products. That's the FlexLock banner of products because we know that they're there. And we know the reps and they have reps everywhere across North America, Canada, and the US. And they get a lot of the same training that we get at TechoBlock. So they understand interlocking concrete pavements. They understand permeable pavements. They understand segmental retaining walls. So we know that we can rely on them and we can work together with them as a team to make sure that you guys, the contractors, can get the best value possible when working with us, working with our products, and delivering value to your customers. So there are a lot of good options. I like FlexLock because they've been very good to us and they've been very good to our customers. I know the product quality is good, and I know that they're always trying to innovate as well. I know the family there personally. Uh, I've been to the labs where they're developing new products, where they're testing stuff, and... Uh, I have nothing but good things to say about their products. So the FlexLock products, G2, sand, especially with the rapid set technology, it's rain safe in 15 minutes. That's a great advantage. Again, it's a seasonal business. If you know the rain's coming later today and you can get that sand in and activate it and it's good in 15 minutes. And I can tell you, I swear, on that showcase project that we built in the summer of 2019 for the 2020 showcases, 
We swept in all that sand on that full project, and it was a torrential, you know, late summertime, heavy, heavy rainfall that lasted for two hours. It was raining so hard that we were just hiding in the trailer, waiting for the rain to stop. And we didn't want to go back to the hotel because we needed to see if the sand was okay. Because if the sand job was scrapped, we had to power wash the whole thing and start over. I promise you the sand was perfect. And it had literally been 16 minutes. And I said, well, this is what it is. And you're telling us it's going to be good. So we're going to go through with it. And, and fortunately, we were able to get that 15 minutes. Literally 16 minutes after we were done activating the sand, torrential downpour, the sand held up perfectly. So I know firsthand experience that G2 rapid set sand is the real deal. And the nitro sand, the new sand they came out with that is wet apply. Uh, it's called nitro because it's packaged with nitrogen. So that that's cool. And that keeps that epoxy within the sand packaging uh, nice and wet. And that's a wet apply sand. So you hose down your sand and then you, uh, you squeegee or sweep the sand while showering with water. And what the water does is the water helps the sand slide down into the joints and helps densify that material because the water again is, acts as a lubricant. So the sand slides down and the sand keeps sliding down to get nice and tight. So that gives you a great uh, finish. Um, there's no risk of polymeric haze either. Uh, and it, there's no risk of uh, any dust being inhaled or anything either. You don't have that uh, either. So it's a, a great option. So both those products are, are good. Uh, Rick. I had a customer ask me later uh, yesterday, any potential issues with hybrid base against a foundation wall? We normally waterproof or use a liner with permeable. So yeah, actually, uh, and let's see if I can find that video. But we did talk about this in the episode today. And that is, let me sort the videos and go find it. Uh, that is what you should be doing with permeable or, here it is, with permeable or with hybrid because there is the potential for moisture, let me pause this, there is the potential for moisture to get up against the foundation wall. And the foundation wall of the house is made with poured concrete, so that is a porous material. And if water accumulates here, that water will get absorbed by the concrete and could cause uh, mold or other humidity issues in the basement. We don't wanna be held responsible for that. So if we do have to build up against the house like we did on this project, we want to put a EPDM liner or pond liner, which we uh, just use a ram set there with the, the nails with the washers. Um, ram set that into place with a bit of glue to seal it after. So we sealed all the openings, sealed the, the, uh, the liner as well. And this goes down and extends out to here. Um, so depending on where, where you are, it's either uh, three meters or 10 feet. Um, that water goes over here and this is where our pipe is. So here you can see that schedule 40 pipe with the holes down. So the water would follow the, the membrane, get to this area and whatever doesn't soak into the soil here would uh, uh, build up and go into the pipe. So yeah, you do wanna put that, that liner in. It's another argument for why we shouldn't be building uh, up against the foundation wall of the house though. So if you can afford to build off of the house, three feet off of the house, we don't have to worry about that step. We also don't have to worry about the, um, you know, the higher risk of settlement because of the over excavation done during the construction of the home. So especially newer developments, newer subdivisions, if you can build away from the house, just come down the stairs, uh, cement stabilize the soil below the, the staircase coming down and then build out into the environment three feet away from the foundation wall, you're greatly reducing the risk of callbacks and that three foot area is a perfect area for decorative mulches, river rock, little gardens, things like that. That will settle inevitably. I'd rather have it be that I have to add a couple extra bags of mulch to top it up than have to come back, lift up the pavers and fix that part because it will settle. There's not a whole lot you can do unless you're the one backfilling the property when the foundation was dug and you can be positive that it's been properly com uh, compacted. Uh, let's see here. Old timers swear by the sock. Yeah, no, no socks on the pipe. Thoughts on fabric underlayment, hardscape specialist. You have to be more specific. I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean there. It, yeah, Rick, it was. Rick was, <laughs> it's funny because that job where I was talking about the torrential downpour with the G2 sand, Rick was the guy who was on sand duty all day. So he had just finished the whole thing off 
And then, like, I tap him on the shoulder and point at the sky, and it's pitch black, and you see his face just drop, like, no. And we were in that trailer, and he, we were joking, we were doing whatever. Rick could not relax because he had spent all day on that sand. And the sand was perfect. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, do, 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 do. Six to nine feet. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Six to nine feet for that liner coming down uh, off of the foundation. Uh, and Hardscape Ottawa agreeing with that. Uh, it's a better landscape design when you're building off of the house. Like Pete said in the show, and like he says all the time, and I agree with him, you don't have a backyard barbecue and you have people getting a plate of food and getting their drink and going up and standing right up against the foundation of the, the house unless there's an awning and it started raining like it did that day in New Jersey. So there's no real need to build there. Stop building there. And yeah, most foundation walls aren't, aren't uh, worth their shit. No, I agree with you. So is it always recommended to build wall against foundation if doing steps? Ah, yeah. Great question. Let me find that video. Guys, for real, you need to get familiar with uh, the YouTube channel because we have all kinds of awesome stuff. So this question is about the um, staircase. So let's say in that last picture that we had there, we had uh, the door, we had the flashing, and we needed a staircase coming down. So what do we do? So you need to build a relief wall, like Pete's saying there. So uh, if I, let's see here. Let's say I go with this one. Uh, no, that's a preview video. Hold on. Let me find the video and then I'll show you guys exactly what I'm talking about. We have a few of these, but I just want to find the right one. I'm going to go with the simplest example. <laughs> give me a second, give me a second. I got it here, so just hang on. All right, get the speed on the play back up. Flip this around. Okay, so this is an old project, uh, 2011. And uh, right now we're talking about using lime to amend the soil at the bottom here. I guess I'll just, I'll just show you this part. So what we're talking about is a relief wall. So in this case here, you're basically building a box. And the reason you're doing that is you don't want to be building up against the foundation wall for a couple of reasons. If you're building up against the foundation wall, you run the risk of trapping moisture. So if you're trapping moisture, that's a problem. Um, I think Pete just sent me a, a diagram or something here. If you're trapping moisture, that's, a, uh, that's going to be a problem because that moisture is uh, going to be absorbed by the foundation wall. The second thing is you don't want to apply additional load up against that foundation wall because that additional load uh, creates a situation of unbalanced fill. What that means is on the other side of that foundation wall is nothing. And now you're building all this extra weight, all this extra load up in this area. So that pressure going up against the foundation wall with no reinforcement on the other side could cause cracks in the foundation of which you would be liable because you're the builder who put that new structure in and you attached it to the house. So if we build independently of the house, we are not going to be um, held liable for any issues with the house because we're not directly attached to it. So that's another uh, benefit there. As you build that up, um, fill it with clean stone. And for sure, if you wanna reinforce it with some biaxial grid, that's a fantastic opportunity to do that. Does the cost go up? Yeah, the cost does go up. Is it built the way it's supposed to be built? Yes, that is also the truth. So definitely the way you want to do it. Uh, and yes, as I thought, that's what Pete said. Perfect. Let me pull this up. And let me show you guys. So this is the cross section of that relief wall. So we're built on our base. We have our relief wall that's built, built independently of the house. We're not touching the house. We have our coping here or a cap that's bridging that little opening. So it looks like it's up against the house, but it's not. And to be extra safe down here where there is the potential for moisture to accumulate, we have a, a pipe and that pipe is just plumbed to drain water out. So any moisture that could accumulate in this area hits that pipe and flows out. And over here, 
we see our wall, we see our open graded stone as the fill. Why do we open graded stone in that application? Because it's very difficult to compact the material here. So if I'm compacting a dense graded material, I'm applying lateral loads on the wall. So I'm trying to pack this stone down. And as I'm packing down, it's pushing out on the wall. If I just fill it with clean stone, I don't have to worry about that. That material inside can't expand and contract with freeze thaw. And the geogrid is holding it together and reinforcing. I hope that uh, that helps there. Um, yeah, I don't know what's, uh, what's up. I'm going to try, Pete's still trying to get it. I'm going to try to leave this and come back in. So everybody, I'm going to kill this live. I'm going to come right back. We're going to get Pete in. Okay. So hang on a second. 